Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special event by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society as we celebrate Windrush Day 2021. It is a pleasure to warmly welcome you all to this director's evening, featuring the special screening of Arthur Torrington's Windrush Pioneers. This evening, you will have the exciting opportunity to watch the film and then chat with the film director and chair of the Windrush Foundation, Arthur Torrington, in conversation with the director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, Alessandra Cummins, about the making of the film and the Windrush experience for Caribbean people in Britain. We look forward to you participating in this discussion through your questions and comments, which you can submit in the Q&A panel on Zoom, or if you're joining us on Facebook, you can submit your questions in the comment thread of this live stream. I would now like to invite the director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, Alessandra Cummings, to give a few introductory words. Thank you very much, Natalie, and good, e good afternoon and good evening to everyone. But most particularly, uh, our greetings go to our speaker and our director tonight, Mr. Arthur Torrington, OBE. We are deeply pleased and privileged to have you with us this evening. And may I say a special welcome back to Barbados, even if only virtually, until we can coax you to the reality of visiting Barbados Assures again. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of uh, a, a special uh, documentary, which was conceived and created by uh, Mr. Torrington and colleagues to create a visual record of the evidence, visual and audio, audio record of the evidence remaining of the, um, that momentous occasion of the Windrush arrival and transmission of West Indians from the Caribbean to Britain immediately in the post-World War II era. And it is extremely challenging on any occasion, but we're extremely pleased to have the benefit of hearing our firsthand testimonies from a number of individuals who were directly involved in that experience. So thank you very much, Arthur, for creating this record. Thank you for your efforts to ensure that it was not forgotten and that it was documented. And thank you for sharing it with us this evening. And now I'll turn the floor back over to Natalie for a proper introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Alessandra. I would now like to introduce the film's director, Arthur Torrington, who will be sharing a background to his work and the film Windrush Pioneers. Arthur Torrington, CBE, is a community advocate and co-founder with the late Sam B. King, MBE, of Windrush Foundation and the Equiano Society, which they established in 1996 in London, England. Through Windrush Foundation, a registered charity, Arthur promotes good race and community relations and designs projects that celebrate the history and heritage of African people. Both organizations publicize the contributions of African and Caribbean men and women who settled in the UK before and after the 22nd of June, 1948 especially those who served king and country in World War I and World War II. Also through the Equiano Society, Arthur highlights the life and times of Alada Equiano, a former enslaved African known as Gustavus Vasa, the African who was a businessman, Royal Navy sailor, explorer, human rights campaigner, best-selling author, war veteran, and abolitionist in the 18th century. Arthur is a founder, member, and chairman of the African Heritage Forum. Arthur, on to you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm very happy to share, um, well, share with you um, something that I've been doing for the last 26 years. Um, it's been a long journey uh, for when Rush to become, I would say, international. Um, when we started it, it was like a hobby really. Um, we wanted young people to understand the journey of their grandparents from the Caribbean, all the islands, all the countries in the West Indies. We were determined it wasn't really meant for all the people in a sense because um, when we approached them, you know, they said, ah, you know, any, any ship, you know, wh wh why Windrush? 
Uh, but we showed them um, the importance of the ship and the controversy um, that the ship caused. And um, we were able to get funding from the, the lottery. The, the, there's a national lottery funding. And uh, we thought that you know, the older folks were uh, passing away quickly. Because after all, most of the people who were on the ship were like 25, 22 years of age and so on. And many of them now um, who would be alive would be about say 91 on average, if everybody had lived, 91. Because at the moment, there's a gentleman who was on a, a program I was on today. Um, he, was, he, is, he was 90 just uh, about three or four weeks ago. And he was a boy on the ship and he was a, a member of the crew. He was a, a cook. Right. So what we did, we actually recorded uh, uh, their voices um, and you'll hear them um, on, uh, on the program. And it's interesting that, you know, these are people who came, you know, ordinary, like if you go on a holiday and you just walk in and you have a, a good time. Um, in this particular case, they, you know, came to England, settled in and didn't realize that the ship that they were on would become iconic. It would cause the British Parliament to apologize and so much trouble. It's become political, the ship, right? It's not meant to be political, but it's just that it's political now and um, we can't stop it, okay? So the main thing is for, uh, for us to help younger people and older folk to understand their own journeys, whether they remain in, in, in the Caribbean, they um, travel. Um, in fact, we've all become one much more than before. So in a sense, you know, when Rush has sort of reunited um, the Caribbean family. All right, so let's let's hear let's hear the uh, let's see the film, and uh, we can talk after. Okay. Great, thanks, Arthur. So um, we're going to load up the film to screen now. And just a friendly reminder, if you're joining us for the first time, um, that you can submit any questions and comments you have for Arthur in our Q and A panel on Zoom or in the comments section in Facebook. In 1940, they were not accepting men of color into the Royal Air Force. A good friend of mine, Sidney Kennard, whose father was an Englishman and his mother was a West Indian lady, he had a pilot's license because they were wealthy and he'd got one in, in America. He actually applied and came to England in 1940 to join the Royal Air Force. A very handsome, light-skinned <laughs> guy in his, and they turned him down. But when things got bad, of course, they can turn to the colonies. And I was one of the first four from Guyana to volunteer. When I was 18, I passed to go to America to work on the farm or in the factories. I also took the test for the Royal Air Force and I passed the test. And my mother said to me, my son, the mother country's at war. Go and help. If you live, it will be a good thing. So I came and served in the Royal Air Force because at that time most West Indians thought it was a good thing and I still think it was a good thing. The mother country was at war and she could not beat Nazi Germany in her own. It was about halfway through that I actually joined because when I asked my other friends what to do they say, oh, I volunteered, and um, what well, oh, about Billy? He's volunteered as well. What about Simon? He volunteered as well. So I said, oh, oh heck, I'm the only, I'm the odd one out here. So the next day, the 
first chance I even did and I signed on, I didn't want to be left out, you know. So um, we all came over because at that age, 18, 19, 20, we felt invincible. Nothing can touch us, you know. We'll come over here and we'll give Hitler the, the hell. One day, my daddy's paper was laying about, so I took it and began to read. And I came across his advert that the RAF would be in town at the town hall and their recruiting meant for the RAF. So I said, here is my um, opportunity. So I said to my dad, this is what I've just read in the papers, that the RAF is recruiting meant for, for England to join the RAF. So we had a talk about it and he said, son, if that's what you want, go for it. And I got down there as fast as I could run and signed the necessary forms and did the necessary tests and I passed and then I signed on the dotted line. In my case, I was going to school then. And then they asked for volunteers to join the Air Force. Uh, a lot of us boys volunteered. Now, I volunteered um, going by what my father used to say, speak, you know, say, you see? It sounded exciting in those days and so on. <laughs> and I, um, I volunteered with um, several others. Um, but in the end, only 21 of us were accepted. Well, just when the, the war started in 1939-45, we're just out of college and there wasn't much prospective in view. So at the time they were asking for volunteers for, for the Navy and I decided to join the, the Navy. And I did a stint there on, from 1941 until 1944 and then transferred to the RAF that were asking for volunteers for the ERC Rescue Service. I was looking for adventure. I've always wanted to travel from a little girl. And I was brought up by my grandfather and my grandmother. And he used to tell me to study hard and travel. So all my school days spent studying and yearning to travel. So when the opportunity came along to join the ATS, although I feared it would be dangerous, I had no hesitation in volunteering. But a friend of mine that we, was, we brought, were brought together, he was working at the Daily Chronicle, at the local newspaper, and he came home in '43 and said to me, the RAF is advertising for people from the colonies to volunteer to go and join and help Britain in the war. And I'm thinking of going, would you come? And because we'd always been together, I thought that was good. If you were going to go on other company, I'd go. So he brought the application form and we applied to join, to volunteer to go to the Royal Air Force. This is myself and the Royal Air Force in 1944 in England. My reason was the reason, it was typical of all the reasons anyone would give you, but they're not to tell you the truth, is to get away from Jimmy and go abroad. And that was the basic reason. We first of all thought that Anything abroad is better than what we have at home. No Good job prospect, no money, because when you have a ten pen at shoppings in those days, there's a lot of money. We thought if you come abroad, you have all the opportunities to educate yourself properly, to work big money, and so on, and to see the outer world. June the 1st, 1944. <laughs> Liverpool mm -hmm. and then from there we were put on a, a train to uh, Filey where we did our initial training and then after that after six or seven weeks we were um, split up in groups and sent into different parts of parts of England Having joined the Royal Air Force, you had to do square bashing, learn to 
walk up and down and drill and all, and take the civil, civil mentality out of you into military. You are told to go, you go, and you are told to come, you come. I arrived in Filey, which is in Yorkshire, in November, 9th of November, 1944. I trained for square bashing, then I went to R.A. Hawkins near Folkestone, and from there I learned engineering. Now, the old-time aircrafts, which is propeller-driven, if they stop, you can ring me, man, even today, and we get it going. Not jets. I know nothing about jets. And I was proud to be British, having served with men from Norway to the Sudan. And we felt that we had to work together to survive. Of course, food was rationed. A lot of people don't really realize that. And I have been hungry, not starving, during the war. First of all, we, we went to Butlin's camps in Filey. This is where we had our initial training, learning about um, different guns and how to use different water ammunition and f different exercise and different drill, combating exercise and all that defense exercises and things like that. We spent um, about another two months there, I think it was. Uh, we had two wings there, as a matter of fact, from the West Indies, and we had to have a certain amount of um, um, backup from the Royal Air Force Regiment, who were there to give us certain information about various ornaments and things like that. A typical day, it depends, you know, we had very um, different duties. You have your on ERT rescue duty. Sometimes you're on um, uh, um, player parts. That's that's mostly night duties. You know you got to hurriedly put these things so that the, the plane you you make a channel for the for the seaplanes. Actually, we were involved with um Sunderland flying boats and Catalinas. That were the the um, the, the, the the two planes that we were involved in. And um, sometimes you have maintenance that you run a taxi service, carrying the um, the, the crews aboard the plane, carrying the engineers, you know. And then you have your your boat duty now, your ears, your rescue. You sit you sit there in the hut waiting for the call. I was a medical secretary for the ten years that I was in the army, and I was employed at the British Military Hospital in Upper Camp, which was good because. It, I got to know practically everybody because at some time or the other, everybody got ill. Uh, I was working in the treatment room, giving, giving out uh, the patients when uh, uh, treatment, you see, from just like a nurse and a doctor, the doctor sent you, give you the list of things that you should do and then you have to serve it to the people then when they came in. I learned to do spray painting for a start. Um, uh, parachute and dinghy repairs and packing and um, other repairs on the boat itself. But that, if, uh, like, say, for instance, if, a, sh if a, a plane is smashed or anything like that. We have to be able to repair the nose or part, whatever part of it is. Um, try and patch it up as best you can so you can use it again. Well, when I was shot down, of course, it created quite a bit of a stir because, you know, I don't think there were many black airmen in those days and particularly black officers in the Royal Air Force. And, and I was in solitary confinement. After I'd been in solitary confinement for a while, Five days I was pulled out in the bright sunshine. A photograph was taken of me. I didn't know for what purpose. At the end of 19... F after we, I was shot down in 43, at the end of 44, we were, the, 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 of course we were aware that the Russians were approaching. We could see refugees fleeing, the German refugees running, going, where, where, you know, going north, south, east, west. 
uh, as the Russians approached, uh, we knew that, uh, that soon we could be liberated. But then we were in January 45, we were suddenly told that we were going to be evacuated, leave the camp. It was in the middle of winter. It was a severe winter. The roads were covered in snow. Um, you know, we were marched, we marched for five or six days in the snow and stopping off in barns and things like that. It was really tough. It and landed also... up in a place about 60 kilometers southeast of, of Berlin called uh, Luckenwalder, Luckenwalder, which is a huge holding camp where thousands of thousands of prisoners of all ranks and it was a it was a really disgusting, flea ridden, disgusting place with hardly any food. There were no Red Cross bars from that was when it was terrible. Suddenly from being this privileged place where we could read music, we had bands, we had sports events, we had a theatre. We you'd had everything that you could possibly have except a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly yes. you got into a, a measly place which was filthy, bedridden with bugs, hardly any food, and the bombs were falling all along. We could, you know, we could hear the bombing because we were so close to Dresden, and to Dresden, of course, was knocked out, and to Berlin, and we could hear the, the war happening outside. But we were aware that the two armies were coming together, the Russians were moving in from the east and the Americans were coming up towards the Elbe. So it was an exciting time, at the same time a, a, a difficult time. And then one morning we woke up and there were no guards. The Germans just disappeared. They, just, they fled? They fled, because they know the Russians were there. And within a few hours the Russians crashed into the, into the, into the camp. <laughs> you know. What about heating in camps? I mean, how did you guys mm? keep warm? Well, it was it, you know, it was cold. <laughs> no heat. No, no, no. We didn't have heat. You know, I can't remember heat in there at all. Though, you know, we would have big old blankets covered in blankets and lice, and you. I think itching kept you warm. When you lay in bed, you were itching so much. <laughs> But there are lots of incidents. That part of the war was very horrible. So I can remember telling Kurt a bit of about my experiences, and he was, you know, but we never got round to this miserable part. And he was saying, gosh, yeah, that was a very privileged <laughs> life because, you know, our money was still going into the bank, our paychecks. <laughs> so really, so when you guys were walking, being, well, being transported and all, just logged, you, you, you were walking in the cold, in the snow, no heat, just walking. So yeah. walking kept you warm? Walking. And then at night we slept, uh, we, if, if we go to a hay barn in a farm, we could bury ourselves in the this, in this snow. Some of the guys went and slept with the cows. That, the cows kept them warm. <laughs> and that for six or seven days? Yeah. You walked? No, on the walk, that was it. And then in the camp. I can't remember. We might have had some burning thing, but it was it was primitive. So, uh, but of course, I mean, there are lots of things I could tell. That uh, that, that part of it is yeah. full of incident. I'm sure. Because I was once sent out on um, a foraging party to go and bring back food, and there were like six of us in in a truck, and we were taken out with a. Um, a Russian guy a company going in this van and we drove into the countryside and we arrived at a farm and it was all slushy from the mud still and you could see dead bodies lying and you had to walk over dead German and Russian people and then told the captain I thought when we said that that we're gonna go and raid some German shop that you know and and steal, but <laughs> found that we had to <laughs> that we had to round up cattle. Now, how would I know how to catch a cow? I'll get it into <laughs> well, That is quite a story. So what that happened? Was a story. What's what happened? Well, it's amazing how things happen. Now, can we, the first attempt is that my pilot, who is a Canadian guy, Alan Angel, 
he didn't know anything about it. He got a big piece of wood, approached a cow, hit it on his head, the cow fell down, he took out his penknife, cut his throat, and that was even worse, because a, dead, a cow is a heavy thing, and to drag a dead cow, pour truck into a truck, that was impossible. But eventually, somebody had the idea, well, why don't we get a halter? So we went to the farmer, reluctantly got a halter, captured the cows, and made a ramp, and caught about six or seven cows and went into it. But we had to go into the same back of the truck with these cows, and the cows are petrified now. And I can remember sitting right at the end of the truck, and the tail of a cow was waving over my head, and the power was petrified, and suddenly I got a blessing, which was the most disgusting <laughs> state of affairs. Can you imagine being shot on your head? <laughs> At the time, the, the, the white Americans, they couldn't realize seeing blacks socializing with, 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 with the white women. That was the most thing, the white women. You see, they just couldn't see it. So they, they are the ones that used to start a lot of, of the trouble and the problems. The poor black American, they couldn't do much because they used to come down on them if they tried to resist. They come down on them like a ton of bricks and lock them up and they never come out again and they just push them off to the front but with with, with us west indians we did put up a bit of resistance you know fight in a pub because it, it was typical for you to sit down in a pub having a drink with one or two female companions and a couple of white americans come in and says okay nigger get out of here well you know Using that word to West Indian is like putting a red red cloth before a bull, you know. And we we used to go haywire. But after afterwards, they realize, don't mess with these West Indians. I remember a case in Nottingham, where some American servicemen, I think they were from the Rangers, saw a fellow man in here. We call him Pig with his girlfriend. The girlfriend had blonde hair around and shoulder and all that. And the Texan came and says, you shouldn't be with that girl. And taking away the girl. And I was there. I want you to be. Pig said, no, it's my war, man. Boom! Knock him down. Next one comes, boom! And that was what it was like, a survivor. And the people, when the police arrested Pig, went to the station and says, this black man didn't do anything. It is the Americans. Well, they said they can't let him out. So they rung the duty officer, Dari Hopnell. He came about an hour after, and the witnesses it, and they let him out. And this was what happened in a lot. The Americans just don't think you should survive in their own environment. Well, I felt relieved it was ended. And I went up uh, when the war, you know, when the war ended in 40, 40, May 45, I think it was, when they had a V-Day, I went up to um, outside Buck House. Uh, we had with all the people there, and um, Buck House and Piccadilly Circus, because everybody used to go there. And we had, you know, meet a lot of people. Well, everybody middle around because they were happy at the end to... But the war was ended. Um, but I, I, I that, that after the war ended, I didn't know what hap what's going to happen. And because we had the, the big demops uh, thing had to put in place, and um, we don't know how long. But then people start dem being demobbed. When the war in Europe ended, the Royal Air Force Command. Um, well, they panicked, and they, they, they decided to um, send back some of the men back to the West Indies, which was in fact not politically correct. Um, they weren't given a choice. They were just um, repatriated back to the West Indies. Well, after 46 November, we went home and got demobbed. 
but the Jamaican government didn't make any preparation for our return or rehabilitation because the, the British government thought well it was the, the Jamaican government to, to look after us and the Jamaican government thought it was the, the, the British responsibility. I did not want to return to Jamaica because I was doing a course with sanitary engineering by um, letters. And when I asked the authorities, they said, no, unless you are married to an English girl or a college have accepted you, you have to go back to the colony. I was very disappointed. I went back in November and the SS Almanzora and after five months, I was not happy in Jamaica. Things have changed. In 1944, there was a hurricane blowing down most of the bananas, coconut. That takes about five years to get back properly. Secondly, I wanted to finish my studies. In Jamaica, my father worked it out that I was going to be a farmer because I'm the eldest son. I had no intention of doing that in Jamaica because planting banana is not a problem, it's selling them. After all the parties and the excitement had died down, I realized that uh, I couldn't live there because I had spent five years in England and my outlook on life was completely different. I knew I was going to leave, but I didn't know exactly where I wanted to go. So I thought I would work. I returned to teaching and started to save for when I would be able to, to leave. I went home and I spent until from 47 June until November. And I didn't get work. The work I wanted to do, I couldn't get because of personal choice. And then I went back to live in Trinidad. And I got a job in Trinidad. I was working in Trinidad. And then the Windrush came in. And the Windrush was offering, this was more like freight passage because they brought troops back, the same as I went back on a trooper. But they were earmarked to go back empty. And uh, you understand that um, I did have a little money. And if I sit around, I know what I'm going to do. I just want to spin it out. So I decided to come to England. I had a guy named Barry. He was in the rough. Then he came home and um, I met him. And then he went to America. And no sooner I come, went to America, I come back and we pal up. He was eight years older than me. Uh, my father worked for... Uh, Bustamante, and um, when I present my dad with my passport and things like that, that I wanted to come to England, he said, no way. However, he took me to Bustamante, and Bustamante told me that they will be eating food out of the dustbin just now in Britain, and I shouldn't come. This photograph was taken of me in Jamaica at my home before I left for England in 1947. In 1948, I decided to come back to England when the wind rush arrived in Jamaica. The day I left at the wind rush, my aunt took me to the quay and I left her on the street crying. It was a very pleasant journey. Yeah, there were um, lots of us were. Uh, Servicemen, the mob here, and going back, look for jobs and so on and so forth. Uh, some of the boys had uh, a bit of rain before with different people they knew over here, and they were going back to uh, to work or something like that. Someone just taking a chance. The were Trinidadian, Barbadian, um, black boys from British and US, and think some in. When they went on the boat, See, all you have to do is, I mean, mingle. You have what you find a friend, I mean, and um, when coming back, I mean, a lot of the lads, I mean, were in the XRA plant, I mean, you knew each other. See, so, yeah. Well, I board Empire Windrush. It was a great, big, true boat. When we reached in the midst of the ocean, we heard that there was a stowaway. 
and everybody trying to see it was who. And all of a sudden, we get to find out that it was a woman. woman. And then we hide her, you know, until afterward, everybody, when they found her, everybody tried to put together and pay off here. Yeah. And they speak up to the captain, you know, not to punish her and so on. We had a fabulous time coming up. I myself, I got a job in the bakery. Because they said if you want to earn a few shillings extra. And the first night I was in the bakery, I hear oh, oh. a sound that like somebody want us. So, <clears throat> but it was two ways. And I pushed my head out and I seen them. And they said they wanted food. I went straight in the bakery. I got a bread. I cut it in half uh, and I went in the kitchen because the kitchen was next door it and I get a tin of corned beef and uh, I gave them. There was four bakers, uh, six six bakers from myself, I was a pastry cook. Um, bearing in mind we were having to feed like 2,000 people going out, there wasn't so many coming back, but um, 2,000 troops and about 240 crew. I can remember these chaps coming on the ship because it was quite an experience to see all these chaps coming onto our ship because they were all English or Scottish or white boys going off to in the army and then bringing the West Indians back, which was quite something. And of course, they were the chaps were lively fellas and they all liked to sing a song and a nice, a good drink of white rum, and uh, it was quite a quite a jolly occasion. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Many are ex-servicemen who know England. They serve this country well. In Jamaica, they couldn't find work. Discouraged but full of hope, they sail for Britain. Citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Prodded by public opinion, the colonial office gives them a more cordial reception than was at first envisaged. Many are to be found jobs. Our reporter asks them what they want to do. Now, why have you come to England? To seek a job. And what sort of job do you want? Any type, so long as I get a good pay. Some will go into industry, others intend to rejoin the services. Now, you're an ex-Air Force, aren't you? Yes. Are you going back into the Air Force again? Yes. Do you know if you'll be accepted? I think so. Some plan to return to Jamaica when conditions improve. I'd like to ask you, please, are you a single man? I am a single man. My, only my mother that is depending on me. And I'm also an ex-service man. Oh, you're ex-service, RAF, yeah, are you? RAF. I took a course in Scotland in case making, and uh, I'm desirous of going back there to see if I can further because I like it very much, and uh, I'm trying to help myself and also help my mom. Their spokesman sings his thanks to Britain. Now, may I ask you your name? Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. Now, I'm told that you are really the king of Calypso singers. Is that right? Yes, that's well, now, will true. you sing for us? Right now. Yes. London. Is the place for me to London, this lovely city. You can go to France or America, India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Well, believe me, I am speaking broad mindedly. I am glad to know my mother country. I've been traveling the countries years ago, but this is the place I wanted to know, darling London. This is the place for me. It was a cold, foggy day on the Thames. Um, documentation, of course, before, but by 9, 10 o'clock, it was a sunny day. There was someone come and met us, and they says, well, you have to have a ration book, and you have to register and everything. At first, Britain welcomed the Sons of the Empire. The Evening Standard sent a plane to greet them as the Windrush sailed up the channel. They came to Attlee's newly nationalized industries, to a country rebuilding after six years of war. 
Many had served in that war and saw their voyage as a journey home. It was immediately after the war and we could not have expected a great lot. We, we expected to rough it. When the boat, it was realized that about a third of the men had nowhere to go. And the authorities, although they didn't want us here, thought it was a good idea to send us to Peckham Deep Shelter. Now, the reason was that it was used during the war as an air raid shelter. And after the war, some students used it. So they took us in minibuses to Clapham Deep Shelter. I think it was about 232 of us. And from there, there we did our documentation. And within one month, everybody had left the shelter and work. One of the first men to got a job was Columbus. The man was a painter in Jamaica. And when he went to the place, and said, paint. I said, well, give me a try. They gave the man a try. He got the job. And within two weeks, he was out of the shelter. And gradually, we left the shelter. But overall, the host nation, the people, were very helpful, even until today. When they landed um, at Tilbury, the civilians, there were um, a, a, a party waiting for them, organized by the, I think, the, either the Home Office or some other department. Civilians to come off the boat. They said to them, do you know where you're going? Oh, oh yes, I'm going to my um, relation in Birmingham. You sure know, you know where you're going. Oh yes, I'm going to Birmingham. Here you are, train ticket to the Birmingham, 20 pounds, off you go. You, I'm going to Manchester, train ticket to Manchester, 20 quid, off you go. Oh, oh, I don't know where I'm going. Oh, well, you stop there then, and I'll tend to you after. It was difficult to get accommodation. And I remember my brother coming, came here in 1949, the year after, and I had a, him in Stockwell, and I was from the Air Force and leave, and I went to see him. We went out to our fish and chips, and I was going up back the stairs. The landlord said, no, no, you can't go up. You don't live there. I said, what? My brother says, my brother, son, that's how it is. You just have a room here and you have to do exactly what they want. He said, but I tell you what, we should buy our own house. And this was happening all about. And by having difficulty, we had to club together and buy our own house. All right, we have an empty house, no furniture, no anything. But you could get second-hand furniture. And most of the traders, if you keep your nose clean, would let you have pillowcase, blankets and all that, and you pay weekly. And today, most West Indians by 1982, especially Jamaicans, own more property than the host nation. Because in those days, the host nation lived in a corporation house or in a council house. It's only of late they think of buying their own place. But we had to. So the civilians were put in, in private accommodation. They didn't stay there for long. Uh, two or three weeks, the longest. Uh, and they were all out. Because they didn't want to linger, you know. They found themselves jobs and accommodation. I was there for about two weeks, I think. Because it's a freeway deep place, you know. Because it was when the... Uh, the northern line running in the morning wake us up because it, we were going to be loaded train line that wake us up and then um, we used to come out in the day and go in the park and then um, we used to walk from there down to Clapham Common. That picture was, took, was taken while I was off guard actually. I didn't realize that it, it was a photographer from the Evening Standard who took that picture. And I, I didn't realize I was on, on camera. I was there, and a Guyanese boy living up the road in Ballam came and met me, another ex-Air Force type. He said, I'm 
Oh, Harry, come on. You don't have to stay there. So I said, where do I go? He said, Nan, he called, called his landlady, he called her Nan. Nan has got a room. I'm certain she'd let you have it. Come with me and I'll introduce. So he took me up and I met Nan. And Nan says, yes, there's a basement room there you can have. For a period, we used to sleep, um, three of us, you know, um, moving around together. And we used to sleep on a tube, get the last tube. And end of the line, some of the tube men that were ex-servicemen used to have pity and lend us blankets and all that. And that's the way we used to survive. And we used to come, come back in town and walk around, walk around in town looking jobs. Most of the houses, one in 10 houses in Southwark have a bath in 1950s or so. So you have the public baths, that's why you have Campbell baths and Brixton baths and all that. And on a Friday evening, you normally go to the bath and you queue for about an hour, half an hour, for 20 minutes. And if you stay longer than 20 minutes, there's a knock on the door. And the people who did not go to the bath, you have a wash pan at the back of the house. You put some water there uh, in your room. You use the wash pan in between, and you have a bath. But in my case, I find going to the public bath was not a bad thing. We sleep together, you know. And the bathroom, there wasn't a bathroom, there was only a lavatory and a kitchen. So when you wanted a wash, you have to go in the kitchen and get a wash. But there was public baths. There were public baths. So if you didn't want to go to the public bath and it was convenient for you to have a wash in the kitchen, the landlady is out there, so you get your wash. I'm an estate agent. How would you like it if a house next door to you was taken by a coloured person and became filled to bursting point with all his relations and his friends and so on and so forth? It was difficult to get a house. I remember seeing a house for sale, 9 Sears Street, went to the bank. The bank says, no, you haven't got a bank account. I said, I've got a post office account. I said, anyway, we can't lend you the money. And this was happening all over. I was in the Air Force. I took the letter to the seller. He said, to think that you have served in the Air Force, you're in the Royal Air Force now, and you have got the deposit. And they would. We will lend you the mortgage. They lend us the mortgage for 10 years. We paid it off in five. In those days, there was a lot of discrimination. People don't want to accept you. And... Uh, Many um, doors have been slammed in my face, you know, looking for rooms and all those kind of things. Most of the jobs that were offered to us as returning from the West Indies, or from Jamaica, I should say, was the most menial jobs. I remember going for a job at uh, a bed and breakfast place as a dishwasher. And after the lady interviewed me, she called her husband upstairs and said, do you want any darkies working here? His reply was, no. I came out of that place crying. I could not realize that people could be so disgusting that the, 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 an ordinary job as washing dishes was refused. During the war, we came here to help. After the war, their attitude was that we came here to take the jobs and things away, if not their wives. The general consensus was it's um, they were only suited for the broom and menial jobs. So wherever we saw a vacancy and went there, they said, sorry, you know, we, we, we haven't anything but a cleaning job or uh, something to do with the broom. I had this paper lead. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't stop in London. Oh, you had friends in Leeds now? Oh, yeah. Time. Oh, yeah. Well, ah, yes, I thought I had it. Yeah. That'll happen. Yeah. Came, came up, I mean, and people who I knew, I mean, I was sorry. Yeah. Black guys or? Right. Well, I mean, well, I mean, I don't know no black people. Yeah. We're sorry, I mean. Things, things change, I mean. No, you're not in the RF anymore, you. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you do? Well, eventually they did find a place, I mean, four of us in a room. And, you know, we struggled a bit. 
So for for, for, for black guys, uh, you know, yeah, 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 oh yeah, no, yeah. One round because he both struggling to get a place. Well, there. No, nobody will let it. Nobody let the place. Nobody let the place. What part of this was that? Was that out? In round, the round, um, round the Hyde Park. Well, it was only Hyde Park here, around the um, shop town here. Nobody would. Yeah. So you'd go for yeah. a place, and what they would, what would they tell you? The, 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 um, people just open the door and look and just shut the door. Yeah. Well, I mean, people who I knew when I was here, I mean, uh, go see them and uh, look. Uh, sorry, the neighbors. Uh, I mean, look up, don't they, they know me. Oh, no, 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 you're not me, I rape anymore, you see. Edric Connor, he got a contract to, to, to make West Indian um, re records because they discovered that they hadn't any traditional West Indian songs on record. And Edric Connor, who was a big star at the time, they got in contact with him, and he heard about this, this, this group that, 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 um, that was, was about and he contacted us, and that and that was the group that made his, his um, record. We, we back him for for the recording. The recording was such a success that he said, "Well, we have to get together as a professional group," which which he did, and that was the birth of the Southlanders. When I landed in this country, I had five pounds in my pocket. We landed at Tilbury, <laughs> and I says, "Here we are. No, we haven't got any plan." and we didn't know where we were going to go. I said, well, Cardiff don't seem such a bad place. Who's, we used to go there, we might get a place, a lot of cement is better than walking down the street, so we jump on it. Of course, he had his wife to think of. I said, all right, then I'll jump on the train now and came to Cardiff. So that was how I come to end up in Cardiff. And I haven't lived anywhere else. Normally to get into chambers you need some financial assistance and that wasn't forthcoming. Uh, but then trying then to looking in the newspapers to see if there are jobs available for people with legal qualifications because everything, businesses are starting up, they must need lawyers. I applied right, left and centre, never even a reply because in every form, every application you had to say place of birth. In that kind of period, I suddenly I heard about the possibility. Somebody says, "Why don't you go into the theatre?" Earl Cameron was playing in 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 a in a play called Thirteen Death Street Harlem, a terrible play, which said the Moss and Bayer tours twice nightly. He got into he was then he went into f the first film he made, The Pool of London, and he left the part, and I auditioned, and. I was offered a part straight away because they were happy to have somebody with there. And for one year I toured in the theatre playing the lead in a play, but twice nightly you learn about the theatre. You know, you learn how to walk on the theatre, how to use your voice and things like that. And it was touring around, so even if you made a boob in one town, it was not so bad. But then the, and the year I used to, I knew my craft, I knew how to speak, how to move and, you know, whatever. And I applied that. From that, I joined the. I applied to join the Royal, the Laurence Olivier Festival of Britain Company. But I found if I had a stable job, yeah, I would help myself and help my friend. Applied to join the police, got the application form. This day, I went to New Scotland Yard for the test. Took the test, and I was surprised. I passed the test. Took the medical. I passed the medical. You have to go before a selection panel, which is about six chief officers and superintendent, whatever it is. And they asked me why I want to join. I said, well, I was in the Royal Air Force. I want a job. They said, well, you're a carpenter, because I went and learned carpentry as well. They says, um, you just want the job um, for easy. I said, no, I want a job for a career. They said, they will send and let me know. Four days or so after I got the letter, they are very sorry um, I could not join the Metropolitan Police. I was disappointed. I lived that in 1983, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police asked Sam King with a gold chain around his neck to get black people to join the police. My first job was, um, my first job was as a, a spray painter at a garage. 
nearby where I was living. I bought that house, and um, but it didn't last for more than a week. And then I got another job as a, a plastic molder, making telephones. That was a day and night job, 12 hours day, 12 hours night. And then afterward, I left there and I went to work in the industrial um, estate in Trafford Park as a storekeeper. And then I left that job as a storekeeper and I joined the railways. And then in those days, you could leave a job at, at one o'clock and get one at three. You could pick your jobs. I left, the, I left the, the railways after about 18 months and I went to the post office where I, was, I, I, I took route for 30 years. On the weekends, we go to the West End, at clubs and all that. And during the week, we are at work, you know. But when it comes to Saturday evening, everybody put on their best clothes and you go in the West End at clubbing and dancing. As I said, the Paramount uh, was one of the most important uh, dancing places for us. They always have what you call jitterbug dancing, you know, and, and the English girls, they were like, they never know much about it, so they like to dance with the black people, black men, to teach them how to dance jitterbug. They couldn't realize seeing blacks socializing with, 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 with the white women. That was the most thing, the white women. You see, they just couldn't see it. So they, they are the ones that used to start a lot of, of the trouble and the problems. He danced with this girl, and the sailor come up and, you know, grab her, choke them, and, and he said, he just turned it down, and the lad just turned on. And the title drop off. The guy just slashed at him with a razor. Luckily, I had a big knot. See? And the title. He nearly passed out in the lad. <laughs> see? And all the boys all the boy just grabbed the girl and. See? When the following night, the girl came back and said, I mean, uh, you know, they finished. A girl who went out with a black man in those days were abused with that. But they were genuine and many, I would say 90% of those people are married today, like Phil Potts. There is that build up of we don't want you, and we don't want you in Notting Hill. And that oh, the teddy bear, not the host nation, maybe just 5% thought they could beat us back to the boats. We as ex-servicemen had no intention of running from Hitler, just more teddy bears. The housing was terrible, you know, right around the stand for the, around the area, like you could see the big notice them up, um, up out the Clapton there, and uh, all over the Amherst Park. Uh, sorry, no colours, no children and no dogs. <laughs> so housing was, was, was terrible, you know. When we came here, me and the wife always work a flank. So first, she always go first and ask for a um, place. And say, what your husband does? Say, well, at that time it was, um, I was doing, you know, I was a um, mechanic. Huh? Yeah. Oh, he works as a mechanic. So, so, so. Oh, that's all right. By well, then she already arranged for the housing and what have you and pay down and all that. So they couldn't, um, they couldn't say no again, you know. So when I turn up, <laughs> it was. <laughs> oh, I was surprised, but some of them I was surprised, but I didn't show it. Like you know, I didn't show it. But um, I know there wasn't um, two keys. You know. I can tell you one instant. I saw the advert. We just got married, and I phoned this lady. She said, "Yes, come along and see the room." I made myself very clear, but she could know my accent that I'm a foreigner. But she didn't know that I was a black foreigner. She thought I was a white foreigner. <laughs> That's how I put it. So when I went, she said to come along. I was there dead on time. I rang the bell. And this lady, when she came out, 
you know, she was sort of frightened when she saw a black man. I said, Madam, I was the one who phoned you. I came about the room. Oh, you know, this sugary excuse. Oh, I'm so sorry. If you were here five minutes ago, you would have got it. But I said, Madam, you told me to come along so you couldn't get tell you what time I would be there. And also, I'm a bit early. And where was this? In the tooting area. So when I say, and I say, Madam, furthermore, I'm a bit early. But I said, look, I said to her, I said, can you <coughs> see that telephone booth there? She said, oh, yes. I said, look, Madam, that's where I was phoning from. And then I didn't see anyone come to your door. And yet you're going to tell me that. I said, why can't you be truthful? Tell me you don't want to say, well, to be honest, I don't want any black person. I thought I would upset you if I said, I said, no, not me. It's your place. You please yourself who you want as tenant. But with me, I like the truth. We wanted to form a start up cricket club. I'm going back now to 1948, when I came back. We wanted to start a cricket club. We didn't have enough men in Leeds to form a cricket club. But, I mean, we went down to Sutcliffe. Myself and a chap went down to Sutcliffe. We had a rain for everything in the back, but all the, all the gear. But we wanted a higher purchase because we can't, we didn't have enough money to do it. And the man said, oh, yes, there's no problem. I read it all the way, every, everything done. All I've got to do is go into Dave, the sat there, to collect the gears and um, pay him so much weekly. And when, and when we went in here, and the man said, oh, I'm sorry, but you can't have it. Why? Why? The boss said, no, he can't, can't, can't trust you people. That was what the man said. Because the boss said, can't trust you people. I swear he can't trust you people. He doesn't know us. He West was. Indian play cricket, man. I know you asked that. Um, most of us would join a cricket club. In my case, the last cricket match I played, um, Johnson, who played for Essex as a wicketkeeper, at, just before, and I opened the batting. Dews, who played for Cambridge and England, was the umpire. So I had a rough idea, but there's another side to it. Where I come from, Patterson's grandfather, Sam P, taught me cricket. Well, Patrick Patterson was one of the West Indian fast bowlers, so I can't blow my trumpet, say so I run in good race. I had my wife with me then. We came over and we went to the Chinese place and we sat down and have a casual drink and so on. The stops came in and uh, what it was like a big fuss. Big fuss all the time. And uh, that was that was on the first occasion anyway. <coughs> Myself and a Jamaican chopped in what's um I forgot the name of him, but we were in Singapore. He had his wife and I had my wife who we went to this place, this place and uh, and we had the group to fight the way out. Yeah. You came and was like making trouble, but what, what was he accusing you of? They have not accused you. They still see you with a head. If they see you with a head, it's a language for a month. Even when your wife or not, they don't know if it's if your wife or not. Uh, they're very, very prejudiced, stupid, ignorant. And my wife, when the parents um, knew that we was going out, actually she was pregnant. And, um, her sister, I had a friend that came to me and said they, they want to put her in a home. So I put on my clothes and I went to her house and I knocked the door and they let me in. And I put my cards on the table. I said, not because I'm black. You may think that I can't take care of your daughter. And as soon as I'm 21, I'm going to marry to her. You know, and I did marry to her at the age of 21 be fit and proper to become a GP. So I nominated three other fellas who were my seniors. They were all munition workers and they came here before me. So I thought it's proper to 
nominate them. That was Jackson, Clark, and Dalton. To my surprise, they says no. No, no, you go. So I, I, um, I, I couldn't back down. So I, I took up the mantle and, and became a JP because they insisted that they don't want it, so I, I must have it. Yes, my um, next door neighbor, he um, came to me and said, suggested that I um, ask if I would like to um, go on the, um, the council, the town council. So I said yes, and they came down, they interviewed me, and I um, was um, co-opted into the um, the council. Next election, I was um, elected, and um, I then I became um, deputy mayor to um, on the Jamaica who was mayor. I came home one evening. The labour group says that. They're going to make Sam King the mayor. I said, what? Mayor is a long-term job. Well, as it worked out, the man who should be the mayor that year got drunk at a party, and the South London press have his picture strumming all over the place. They want a safe pair of hands. I got home about 10 o'clock. My wife was in bed. I said, mayor, you know these people are stupid. They said they're going to make me mayor. She looked at me in her face and said, Sam, you're disciplined. You're capable. You could do anything if you have any ambition, but you've got no ambition. I said, well, I have to have a little ambition, you know. A year after, the Labour Group in selected me as a mayor. Now, once the Labour Group selects you as the mayor, you're there. Because the opposition, we were about 44 out of 62. So the opposition only talked. But give them their due, no one opposed Sam King as a mayor. Because my background was Royal Air Force. My background was with Claudia Jones, God rest her soul, I was responsible for the finance for the first West Indian Carnival. I was a member of the ex-servicemen. So I've done my little bit and I've done my homework. It wasn't until Tom Dows Jr. was about 16 years of age that he realized the significance of the arrival of the Empire Windrush and the role his father played in the Windrush story. I've always known that he came here, I was one of the first civilians after the war. Uh, the first time I was aware of exactly when, I would probably be about 16 because it was coming up to the date because I remember him saying that he left in May 48 and arrived in June the same year. And I said about 16, 17 when I sort of began to realise the significance of it and why he came here and he, when he came here never intended to stay very long. I always remember him saying everything ever intended to carry in his life was a suitcase. It's the next thing he got married and got children and all those plans went out the window. Barry, the last of the five sons, born and bred in Derby, first knew about the Winner's story during the 1990s after he started to work in London. His father told him about his stay at Clapham South Deep Shelter. Uh, he was one of those that had n literally nowhere to go. He didn't have any contacts over here or any family. And uh, quite a number of them were put in a deep shelter at Clapham South tube station. Now, unfortunately, he told me his first night there he had his wallet stolen, so it wasn't a great uh, welcome, welcome to the mother country, especially as, uh, if I remember correctly, they'd been outside Tilbury for a few days whilst it was debated in Parliament regarding that. And I'd even looked into it, and on like the public record office websites, you can see the government papers discussing what was going to be done with these few hundred Jamaican immigrants. The local labour exchange had about various jobs, and one that struck him, why you'd have to really ask him, was working in the foundry in a town just outside the Derby called Ilkeston Stanton Staveley, which is one which I don't think exists anymore, but it's a well-known foundry. And he took the job up that. He, he's, he took the job up that. Why? It just seemed to attract him, and he he was he he moved up to Derbyshire pretty much soon afterwards. But on his arrival in Derbyshire, Tom had some difficulty finding accommodation. A lady come out, opened the door, 
and opened the front door and I said to her, I've seen in the paper, because I've got a telegraph in me, and I said, I've seen in the paper that you've got a lodging here. She says, oh, yes, nice lodging. Will you come in? And when I went into the hallway and she turned the light on and see I was coloured, she screamed like I was, you know, went to rape her or something like that. She says, oh, no, please go, please go. I can't have you, I can't have you. Please go. Just like that. Tom Douse was a clever businessman. Dad always had the attitude that if you're in a, in a country like England, he says you've got to make sure you, you, you serve everybody. So what he said was that obviously Jamaicans would come in because of me being a Jamaican. What he needed to do was to get the English people to come in. So what he would do, we'd put things outside like dad's soap pad and that sort of thing to let them know that we sell what they want. And we also do, used to have a very good trade with the Indians. We used to sell a lot of um, the spices they, they used you know, in Pakistan, because again, they were just starting to come after the war as well. His wife, Iris, complimented his drive and determination. But at first, her father wasn't keen on the marriage. There was an initial awkwardness with my uh, granddad. He wasn't too keen on the marriage, but certainly my grandma was, uh, the, you know, he called her mum from quite early on. And because my mother was under 21, um, she was the one who signed the consent forms for them to get married. So I, I, I would say overall, I mean, my granddad, you know, I would say he was just typical rather than anything in particular. It was typical of that time. But he gradually changed his mind about my father. But my grandma certainly was, you know, not somebody who objected too much, which in, for those days was quite, you know, quite surprising how accepting she was. Tom and Iris were not just loving couples, they were ideal business partners. If you think about the period when they first met and they got married and as well started great, uh, creating businesses, that was very, uh, sort of very standout mixed race couple that were running businesses like that in a town like Derby. So, I mean, again, they sort of set an example of you know, it's other people's problems if they you know, don't accept you, you know, just get on, you know, there's an element of where we just get on with it. And I think that's sort of shown in certainly how my, myself and my siblings have progressed in life as well. We've overcome a lot of obstacles to get where we are. Tom Dowse is a remarkable man. He has made a significant contribution to life in Derby, and he is certainly a role model. A man can come, well, not in him, but quite a few others, can come to a land so far away the way, in some ways, it, they, were, they met with a certain amount of hostility, the cold climate, and for them to stay and stick it out and do what they do, well, anything's possible. Thank you, Arthur, for sharing this incredibly important film filled with so many fascinating and interesting, moving personal histories. Um, we do have some questions lined up. Hey. And the first, <laughs> so we might jump right in. Um, the first one is directed to Arthur specifically. Um, how have you found that the generational, the so second and third generation Caribbean awareness and response to Windrush has been since you filmed Windrush Pioneers and how has it affected the Caribbean communities you work with? Well, it's just beginning to take off um, because we've got Windrush Day. Um, that happened in 2018, three, three years ago. So um, it's been slow. You know, I've been doing this thing for like, what, 25 years, um, it's been slow because um, there's some people who actually don't um, appreciate history. But I think um, three years ago when it was shown the importance of the history, I mean, after all, you know, I mean, we've had some good events. For example, this particular um, event was, um, what, about 10, 10 or so more years ago. And um, I went around and I interviewed the people I shared the, 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 um, the, the DVD with, I mean, I would say hundreds of people really. 
Um, and even now, I know I still I still have copies of it. But the main thing now is that the younger um, persons are really going into it, um, young and old. It's a it's an intergenerational um, documentary, and the whole story is intergenerational because the importance of history, and especially the history of the Caribbean, um, is becoming more important as the days go by. Great, thank you. This next one is posed to both Alessandra and Arthur. Um, we see the importance of oral histories in archiving the Windrush generation, but this documentation process also often features music, art, and poetry. What role do you both think that these cultural aspects of our identities help to articulate the stories of Windrush? Hmm. What role do we do we consider they have? Um, I think it would be quite impossible to um, to tell these stories without without the oral testimonies, without the music, um, without various forms of of creativity uh, being drawn in. I think what we have learned um, with the recently concluded EULAC Museums project is that uh, the, the history of the Caribbean in general cannot be told simply in terms of objects or images, but must have the spoken word, the movements, and, um, and, and the sound. Um, that has been evident in, in a number of projects over the years, but tends to be applied specifically in, in arts contexts. History is only now catching up to the arts, and I think it's, it's, it's a critical form of expression, um, particularly in the context of um, documenting our histories and then uh, exhibiting it for public information, exploration and pleasure. So I think, I think um, it has a critical role to play. Yeah, very good. But you can speak too, Arthur. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, I mean, I, I, I work um, with museums. I work, on, as you remember, uh, uh, the Doc Docklands Museum. You you were there a few times and mm -hmm. and then uh, the Black Cultural Archives. Yes. Um, and it's a case of um, having objects. Um, objects are important. But I think the human aspect, you know, um, like how the the DVD, the the um, the video was done. Um, that is really good history, because the most history, if you look back in the in the past, um, is based on what people spoke then, right? And suddenly that becomes you know very um, important. You know it's evidential. You know authentic, but it's mainly people's opinions that become now so solid as though, well, you know, it's written in stone. Mm -hmm. So we've got to do that. We've got to keep records, you know, of, of, of our um, young people, old people, in fact, anybody. We shouldn't think that old, only old people should um, be recorded mm. for, for oral history. We must talk with the young, talk with the young when they're five, 10, yeah. 20, 50, 30, and then when they're 100. You'd find that that will teach a lesson so a generation, maybe 50 years hence, or, or so. Th that's my philosophy. Thanks. The next question is for Arthur again. Um, your film is an incredible wealth of stories, both of individual experiences, but also of documenting a kind of Caribbean camaraderie in the face of adversary. Um, this question is, has two parts. The first was, if you'd like to share a little bit about your experience, you know, what was it like for you as someone both from the Caribbean in the UK and as a filmmaker to encounter this wealth of stories to document this process? And um, how have you found that some of the views that were shared in your film have shifted over time? Well, I, it's, it's a very important um, question in the sense that uh, I knew I knew all of those um, individuals. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't met 
the very last interview, I hadn't met those uh, sons before. I'd met the father, I met the mother, and you know, great people. Mm -hmm. And what I've found, I mean, there's a mixture of a lot of people there. We have Trinidadians, we have, we, have, uh, about, we didn't have any Barbadians at that, at that time. Um, but the thing about it is that bringing the different countries in the Caribbean together, and that's what I did, really. And that wasn't that easy, because if you notice the story, the storyline, the experiences were very similar, right through. And I was able to put that together um, in a way in which any young person, you know, listening could see those young men who came, some of them came uh, in under 20, you know, uh, um, years of age. That, 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 that man, um, George um, McPherson, he was saying that both he and his girlfriend, and obviously his wife eventually were under age. In those days, 21 was the actual age to get married. And he said, you know, I'm going to marry your daughter when I, got, when I get to 21. And he did. And I remember um, meeting with him, his wife had passed away, you know, he'd lost her, he felt, you know, so bad about losing his wife. So for me, it was a great story. I mean, it touched me throughout. And I was able to, you know, understand the journey from mm -hmm. young to old. It's quite something. And I feel that, you know, the DVD, when it's shared, any, any, anybody, anywhere, any part of, of the Caribbean will help to understand the tenacity, and you know, I showed you the war about the war. They served in the war. I mean, that was something. Mm -hmm. um, to to be able to, you know, to to volunteer your life in service, you know, for the empire, it's quite something. And then you you go through all the problems with surviving, and survive because each of those people was successful. At the end of the day, okay. Thanks, Arthur. Yes, definitely a diverse range of very important stories. Um, one of the things that was striking as well in the film was the, you know, touching on the impact that it had on the Caribbean region. So some of those who would have gone during World War um, II went back to the Caribbean and then back to the UK. And um, I know, Alessandra, you've been working on the EULAC Museums project, which looked um, in part at migration and gender, particularly the impact of Windrush generation in the Caribbean. How do you think that um, the, the awareness of Windrush has grown in the, the past years within the Caribbean region itself? I, I have to say I'm particularly grateful to this project for having given us the opportunity to focus for four years on, you know, looking into this story, which was one instance where Barbadians left home to better their lives and to serve country and community. Um, it's only one of several instances, but it was an important moment because we really hadn't captured that story when we were talking, when we were doing um, research on the history of World War II, for example. World War II, you know, the, the stories of wars tend to be told um, from the point of view of a country or countries or groups of people. Arthur's work and the work that we did within the ULAP Museums Project allowed us time and opportunity to break down these stories into the, the personal experiences of individual and helped bring these stories to life. So this was, this was a critically important opportunity. Um, too many times uh, history is told from one authorized perspective. And here it is that we had many people um, telling us what they experienced. And, and the experiences are true because if you match them to the history books, we've, we've read stories about people um, 
surviving um, the the uh, arrivals and the confusion on land and trying to make a life for themselves. We've read uh, histories or heard histories or heard lectures on um, the experiences during the war, but to hear it from the voice of an individual who went through that, became a prisoner of war, survived that experience, and then came out to be able to be his own witness. That's incredibly moving. And I also want to particularly salute you, Arthur, for making the effort to include the voices of women, because too often history is literally history and not history. So this was an important opportunity to be able to, to hear that other voice, um, that critically other voice, which does not even play a role in documentation in so many ways. So I think that um, the, the, the last thing I would say is that we, we really learned the lesson that Barbados's history is not confined to 166 square miles. Uh, it continues to reside outside those shores. It is in the minds, the memory, the memories, the, um, if you like, the, the emotions and the, the values, the critical values of, of many people. In fact, more people outside the Barbados than inside the Barbados. And it's critically important that we pay attention to, to the fact that when we talk about Barbadian history, we're talking about the Barbadian diasporic history. So this is what um, the Windrush um, pioneers meant to, to, to see this evening. And this is what we have learned and experienced as part of the ELAP Museums project. Yeah, and to add to that, um, is that what, what I found is that I'm, I'm able to talk about not only the history post-war, post right? The fact that we have the, the ship Empire Windrush, there are two elements, Empire, Windrush. You're looking at Empire back to the 1600s. And I can say this, you know, I talk a lot about Barbados, about St. Kitts in the 16th century. Sorry, you know, in, in the 17th century, I should say, whereby um, the empire is being built. The empire is being built on people of obviously European and African um, uh, 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 on, on their back, so to speak, but more so on Africans. I mentioned that specifically to show that were it not for that particular, um, I should say, uh, aspect of the history whereby You've got Africans um, being taken to, to the West Indies, um, serving and making Britain a power, a power of the sea. Britain, the actual empire was an empire of the sea. And, and it was built um, on, on the basis that, you know, you, you, will, you will use your, uh, the ships and you get your troops and you'll take this particular place, that island and so on. And each time, an African would be going with the British. For example, you know, the, the Africans go with, 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 the, with the Barbadians to Carolina and, and various things like that, you see? And that is how the empire is built. And, and, and that's the sort of thing that I do. Uh, and I, and I, I, I tell the Home Office, you know, they're the people who um, didn't realize that the empire was actually built that way, really. And each time I can show them that Go back before Windrush um, ever happened when that ship was changed. The name um, was Monta. The, the, the Monta Rosa was the actual name of the ship. It was changed to Empire Windrush. Maybe miraculously, they were using um, a river, a river, the River Windrush, and they were putting Empire in it. So we combined the two Empire and Windrush. And we tell the whole story, not just the post-war story, but the whole story. From the time they went into Bermuda, 1612, you know, we go right through. Uh, and that's what we do. And that's, you know, that's getting a lot of, um, a lot of listening ears. Right. Thank you, Arthur. Um, 
Thanks, Arthur. I think that leads quite nicely into um, the final question, which is directed for you, but also may be relevant to some of what we experience here in Barbados and the wider Anglophone Caribbean. Um, because as much as the Windrush period is Caribbean history, it is British history, but is often absent from the school history curriculums. Um, so we wanted to know if you've had the opportunity for the film Windrush Pioneers to be an educational resource in UK schools and how you think this, the stories of the Windrush um, can be better incorporated into learning opportunities. That is a very good question. I'll tell you why it's a good question because I can tell you how, well, uh, the actual, the journey of getting it into the curriculum. It's in the curriculum now. Um, uh, at Windrush. But when we started out, you know, it wasn't something that anybody bothered about, but the campaigning, we campaigned. Um, and I can combine the Windrush and the Equiano Society in the sense that uh, we were doing it at the same time. Um, Equiano was hardly known in the 1990s, um, mid 1990s, and, and Windrush was not known at all, really. Um, so we worked and campaigned. Um, for it to be included in the curriculum. And it went in the curriculum for the first time in 2000 and, um, let me see now, 2008, that's right, 2008. But then politi politics came in, a new government came in, the conservative government came in and took it out, took out Equiano, didn't bother about Windrush. But then as time went by, more campaigning took place and Equiano and Windrush are in the curriculum as a part of British history, and I think forever. I say, I say forever uh, confidently in the sense that with the Windrush um, trouble and scandal, um, and I think that the government wouldn't try it again. They've learned their lesson. Really, their hands have been, the, the hands and feet have been burnt, really. When the hands and feet are burnt, you can't, that's what's happened, really. And it's now seen that it's important to look at the history as a joint history. Um, and therefore, it's owned by both parties. And that's how it's happening. Very few politicians, you know, are, are bothering to challenge what we're doing, really. Because they're seeing that it's important. And this thing about the Winrush scandal and what happened there with coming into the country um, from the 1948 um, situation, the, Nationality Act and, and treating people who settled in the way they did as though well you don't belong here, although the law was on the side of those who settled. And the same people who made that law, as though they didn't really want to own it up. With the Winrus scandal, they were so embarrassed, really. I have to say that you've never heard so, so many apologies in one day. Apo until you get fed up of hearing apologies about what happened, you know, by denying individuals, you know, um, a degree of dignity, dignity, and denying them a part of what their four parents created. And that's important. And now it is being seen. So I'm actually doing a lot of studies um, with, uh, and well, discussions with um, Home Office officials. You know, and 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 they wonder, they, you know, talk, well, you know, they should have been knowing this thing at school, really. <laughs> it should have been in school. Why shouldn't it be in schools? You see? And it's as though they're going back to school now with some of the stuff that we're doing. So yes, it's a part of British history. It's an essential part of history. That's what we've always told them. And they need to give it respect as respecting anybody's history, you know, their own. Scottish history. Um, Irish, um, even the Irish, even the, um, the Welsh have now made it compulsory that it be taught in schools. Well, Britain hasn't done it yet. In fact, no, I'm wrong. It was done in 2008, as I said, and um, by the Labour government. Conservatives came in and took it out as a compulsory subject. Now the debate has gone back again as, as being compulsory, and I think it's going to happen. Only a matter of time. That's my view. Okay. Thanks, Arthur. And Alessandra, is there anything you would like to add regarding curriculums here in Barbados or the Caribbean? 
Well, I what I would say is that um, the museum has been contributing to the work of a, of a small committee um, led by the University of the West Indies, Dr. Henderson Carter, on behalf of government. Because Barbados, like other Caribbean countries, and even the UK, I might add, um, I think made an error in judgment in removing history as a compulsory subject for secondary school. So while historical subjects were taught within social, uh, social studies and uh, things like this, um, there is a feeling that the, the country has, has been diminished. It's, it's, hist it's historical identity, it's experience, its contribution to the history of the world. And um, so this story, the story of Empire Windrush and the legacy of Empire Windrush has been recommended by us to be included into a new history curriculum. So we look forward to it living in, in that context and the and from the perspective of the Barbados Museum, which is an educational institution, even if it's informal education. Um, we are in the process of redesigning and redeveloping, reconceptualizing, as it were, the, the core of our, um, our exhibitions, which tell the stories of Barbados. Empire Windrush and that whole experience, that whole uh, sequence of migrations which Bobby has experienced, but which led to us being uh, linked to different societies around the world is incredibly important to make sure it is a central part of the new exhibits that we design um, in conjunction with our community members and as they wish to be told as they wish their stories to be told. So that's, I think, both the formal and the informal, if you like. Yeah, I fully support that actually, because um, that's how I, um, well, how I talk with people, um, English people, Scotch and, and so on, uh, in a similar way whereby they respect the history. That's, that wasn't happening before. And it's a good way uh, uh, that Barbados, um, uh, is approaching it in which it is showing, Barbados is showing that she has a place in, um, in the world and what it's done for the whole, um, for, the, for world history then, especially British history, really, and that in future, all Barbadians and any, anybody else, West Trinidadians and whoever, should see it um, herself or itself in that sense as important not just a small country, but an important country because of the importance of what happened um, in terms of the British. The British became a powerhouse um, and felt that you know, only they can do it, uh, not realizing that other people were crucial to it. So yes, Barbados has a right um, to be international, talk about itself and to show um, that it's a part of uh, the whole British idea um, of, of, of world history uh, and its importance of, of civilization. That is my idea anyway. It's a pleasure, you know, to be able to share the idea with you. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Thanks, Arthur and Alessandra. We do have a comment from one of our viewers this evening um, from Bill Hearn. He says, there's so much misinformation about the Windrush and your work to accurately document the truth is invaluable, Arthur. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks, Bill. Now, Bill is a, is, a, is a great worker for us. He's one of our researchers. When a friend like Bill can visit Barbados, you know, and, and identify the Equiano plaque there, and you know how much uh, uh, that, that, that uh, we, we work on Equiano, and Bill is one of our great researchers. Um, because Equiano is so important to the whole history. So in the sense that Equiano mentions Barbados in his book, 
that's the kind of thing that we, we want the whole world to know. That's the point. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> okay. Great, thanks. So I think that concludes all the questions and comments we have this evening. Um, I'd like to invite either of you to say any final comments before we wrap up. Yeah, only that I'm hoping to visit Barbados sometime next year, so I'll be able to share some more stuff with you. It'll be up to date. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Arthur, for for being with us this evening and for sharing your work and your ideas so generously. Um, I do want to say that I think uh, these kinds of conversations are critical to helping uh, more of our community understand the connections, understand the need to value those connections and to ensure that the, the history and the memory that has been shared with so many individuals in, in, um, in this documentary, um, it, it, that it continues to live on uh, through this media. And Arthur, I would say that the only thing that I found lacking in your documentary is that you did not speak about your experience. Oh, your family. Yeah, I take the point. That's true. Well, it was about them. It's about the pioneers. I wasn't a pioneer. Maybe a I pioneer, know. a pioneer in doing the film. So I have lifted them in that sense as okay. pioneers. <laughs> so the, the word sticks. <laughs> I'm that generation, you know. Yeah. Next. <laughs> but okay. that's the only thing. Maybe, you know, that, that will happen. Maybe Bill will help me to do that. <laughs> but there we are. <laughs> okay. So thanks, but thanks again. a great deal. Thanks for the, and... for the, for the session. Yes. And I'm hoping to see you guys at some point. We look forward to that. All and right, you, you have I a will, standing we, we, invitation we, to join us. Oh, yeah, yes. we will keep in touch. Okay. It definitely, right. it definitely sounds like a sequel of Windrush yeah. Pioneers is in order. Without, <laughs> yes, without without it, Arthur. It's, it's, it's going to happen. And thanks to all your staff and all the people who helped yeah. to put this together. All right. Thank, thank you so right. much, so Arthur. We're gonna, all right. We're going to slip away then. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody.